Hi everyone, I'm Francesco Estragues and I'm an Applications Engineer for MPS and I'm joined today by Ralph von Berger and we will present the webinar about automotive lighting design and EMI best practices. First of all, we are going to do a brief introduction on automotive lighting and then we will answer what is so tricky about lighting power supplies. After that, uh, we will give some comments uh, on how to improve the design at schematics level. So before going into layout and uh, testing, and then we will talk about uh, component selection. Then my colleague Ralph will take over and he will give you some tips to solve EMC issues with good layout, and he will discuss uh, correct layer stack. At the end, there will be an open Q&A, so uh, feel free to serve your questions uh, for them, and we will answer. <laughs> so in the automotive market, LED lighting is gaining uh, popularity over the traditional halogen light bulbs, uh, mainly because it offers a higher efficiency, flexibility of design, since uh, you can implement uh, things like dimming and dynamic signaling very easily, and overall, it gives more control. Here on the right, you can see some uh, typical applications where uh, LED lights are being used in the automotive uh, environment, and uh, MPS has a solution for uh, all of them. So uh, here on the bottom, there is the MPQ7200, which is one of our newer uh, LED drivers that implements some uh, interesting features, like uh, an external NTC to control the LED temperature uh, and uh, the rate it according to temperature. So you can increase the lifespan of the LED. And it also has the current sense internally, so you don't need this big uh, current sense resistor that would be placed here that increases power loss and uh, heat cost and area. So what is so tricky about uh, lighting power supplies? To illustrate this, we have taken this example with the Porsche 911, which is uh, an extreme example that has uh, this uh, very long rear light that spans uh, all in the back of the car. And it looks very nice. The design is quite good. But for sure, uh, when designing, this was a problem with uh, EMC. To power this uh, LED uh, string, uh, one, one IC that could have been used is the MPQ24833, which is a switch mode power supply that can work in three modes, uh, back, back boost, or boost. To implement back boost or boost, it uses uh, an, in, an inverting uh, topology. So it has one integrated MOSFET, and then there is the synchronous external diode. And by uh, creating a negative voltage, you can get a very high voltage differential between a uh, pin and uh, the negative minus LED, which is the negative output. This way, you can connect many LEDs in series and get these very long uh, LED strings uh, working perfectly. So by looking at the rear of the car, uh, we can roughly estimate that it uh, has a 200 centimeters uh, LED string connected to the converter. And accounting for the return path for this uh, LED current, uh, we have a roughly 400 centimeters loop. This is a perfect antenna. This is uh, longer than the antenna on top of the car for the FM radio. And luckily, it is uh, enclosed in the chassis. But still, since we can see it from the outside, uh, this antenna can pick up noise and can emit noise. So this can be a nightmare for uh, EMI. When talking about EMC, there are two things that concern us. First of all, there is uh, electromagnetic emissions, which is the electromagnetic noise that our device emits to the environment. And there are two main sources for this. First of all is the power, the power loop, which consists of the input capacitors, the switches inside the IC, and the power inductor. These are the main sources of emissions in our circuit. Then uh, we have the, the load. So by connecting the LED through a very long wire, any AC current that is flowing through this wire will emit uh, EMI to the exterior. The next thing that, that we need to consider is interferences, or when talking about our device, it's uh, immunity to interferences. We need to make sure that our device can survive any noise injected to it up to a certain level to ensure that it can uh, be compatible in the car. As we say, uh, great design brings interesting challenges. So every engineer loves to solve a complex issue. And now we are going to talk uh, how to solve this complex EMI uh, problem. 
this is the same schematic as before. And this is the bare components that the IC power supply needs uh, to work. And now we are going to add a couple of things to it to make it more robust for EMI. First of all, we are going to add here on the left, on the input, a differential filter. This input filter uh, is the, the purpose is to attenuate the fundamental switching frequency and its low frequency harmonics. This uh, switching frequency uh, typically is either 400 kilohertz or 2.2 uh, megahertz. So depending on the switching frequency, we can use a bigger or a smaller filter. For higher frequencies, this is not so useful because the, the inductor has a parasitic capacitance between its windings and the high frequency noise can just uh, run through it, no problem. But for lower frequencies, this, this is almost mandatory in any automotive uh, design. Then on the output, we can add also a differential output filter. Since we are having this very long antenna, we need to be very careful uh, how we connect the LEDs. And the AC carbon that couples to, here, to this uh, string uh, will bring uh, many problems. For example, uh, even the output ripple from the switch mode power supply can bring some problems, so we need to filter it. We are adding two inductors, one on each terminal of the antenna and a capacitor. This also brings the benefit that it prevents that any noise that is picked up in this antenna uh, from coupling onto our device. Then uh, we need also to consider this is connected very far away from our device. And all these wires have a parasitic coupling to the car chassis since this uh, LED string is mounted onto the chassis. So uh, if there is an AC current here, it will couple capacitively to the chassis. Now we have a problem because we have some current that is entering from the left from our input in the connector, but is exiting our PCB from a different place which is a capacitive coupling to the chassis here. This creates what is called a common mode noise. And uh, it is one of the biggest problems in automotive lighting, since usually all the loads are uh, remote from the power supply PCB and are connected through long cables. One thing to improve the performance for common mode is to add a couple of capacitors on the output. They are usually called white capacitors. And they are both connected to the ground potential on our PCB. The purpose of those capacitors are to uh, create a low impedance uh, path for the high frequency noise to uh, exit through our ground instead of the capacitive coupling to the chassis. They bring a slight improvement, but uh, are very useful. Last thing that we, we can add is uh, since uh, it is very likely that we will have uh, big common mode uh, noise issues, is to add a common mode choke at the input. But those common mode chokes are expensive and very big. And many uh, lighting designs are very constrained on cost. So a workaround that we can use is placing uh, two ferrite bits, one on each uh, terminal of the connector, so positive and ground. This is only... Uh, useful when the input current is low, but it can help attenuate uh, the common mode noise since common mode noise is entering from the input and exiting from a different uh, place. If we attenuate the high frequency noise at the input, we are uh, producing the noise overall. <laughs> now I'm going to talk about the uh, component selection. So regarding these ferrite bits, they have a drawback, a uh, very big drawback which is that they suffer greatly from DC current saturation. So even if the manufacturer advertises a fair bit up to 6 amps, this is not true. 6 amps is only the rating for thermals. So they have a DC resistance. If, if, in, if you run uh, some current through it, they will hit. But uh, even for a 6 amps uh, ferrite bit, if you run 2 amps DC current through it, they will saturate and they will lose 90% uh, of their impedance. So as a rule of thumb, you should apply at least 66% uh, the rating when using a uh, ferrite bit. So for example, if you have a 6 amps ferrite bit, you should only use it for a maximum of 2 amps DC. If you want to use it for more, uh, it won't be uh, very useful. You would be better off using some small inductors or just uh, using a typical common mode choke. Another thing in the circuit that also suffers from a DC BS 
is the capacitors, but in this case, they are affected by voltage bias. A uh, capacitor will lose uh, capacitance as its voltage across the terminal increases. Uh, for a typical car battery supply of 12 volts nominal, uh, we typically use 50 volt rated capacitors. This way, we ensure that the value that appears on the schematic is close to the one in the PCB. If in this case, we were to use for a 12 volts uh, car battery, we were to use 16 volts capacitor, that will probably have uh, less than one microfarad capacitance. And this is not desirable because these are the, the bypass capacitors that provide the AC current to our uh, switching power supply. In this case, since we have an inverting topology, and this is quite common in LED lighting, we need to make sure that the capacitor that is connected between V in, so positive input voltage, and VSS, which is the negative output voltage, is rated with enough cap capacitance. In this case, we have chosen a 100 volts capacitor. Now let's talk about the filters. The input filter is going to filter low frequency uh, harmonics and the switching frequency. So we recommend using an inductor of between 1 and 4.7 microhenries. This is a good trade-off between size, DC resistance, and attenuation. If you are using a switch and mode power supply that switches at 400 kilohertz, you are likely to need at least a 2.2 microhenries or 4.7 microhenries. If you are using a 2.2 megahertz switching power supply, you can use a smaller inductors. For the output filter, since it is usually dealing with higher frequency noises that create problems, uh, we can use uh, just a nano Henry's uh, inductor within 220 and uh, one micro Henry. And this is also a good trade off between size and DC resistance. These capacitors, the Y capacitors that will filter uh, common mode noise, when choosing them, there is a very useful tool called uh, Sim Surfing by Murata. But I'm sure that any other uh, capacitor uh, manufacturer will have a similar tool. And this is a website that you can go and you can choose a capacitor and specify at which uh, DC voltage will work and the temperature of uh, operation. And you can choose the case, the package, uh, everything. And it will tell you uh, the real value of the capacitance and also of the impedance. So let's say you have identified a common mode uh, noise problem at the output at around 70 megahertz, then you can go on the website and choose a capacitor that has its minimum impedance at 70 megahertz. This way, you ensure that the filter is at its maximum effectivity. Last thing that I want to talk about is the power inductor. The power inductor here is the main uh, source of E-field radiation. Even if it's uh, typically considered like a magnetic part, the main source of radiation is electric field. This is caused because it is connected to the switch node and the switch node is a node that is switching constantly, very rapidly between V in and the reference voltage. And uh, electric field is, uh, is proportional to the voltage divided by a uh, differential of time. So there is a very high electric field here. And the inductor, the way it is uh, built, there is a wire or copper plate that goes from the connecting path and wraps around the magnetic core. It uh, makes some windings until, uh, up to the top, and then it makes uh, several layers if needed. Uh, nowadays, the manufacturers have identified this issue, and they are marking the start of the winding with a dot on top of the inductor. If you connect the start of winding to the switch node, you are connecting the shortest path possible, possible between a switch node and uh, the inductor, and you are minimizing the electric field emitted. Uh, besides this, we recommend using always a small and flat inductor to limit the amount of electric field that it emits. If not, it can be a problem for uh, monopole uh, measurements in CISPR 25. This thing about the started winding is not a joke. We have seen uh, differences of uh, up to 6 degrees just in the same PCB just by turning the inductor 180 degrees. And people who work in EMC will know that 6 dB is many times the difference between failing or passing compliance. So uh, take, take this in mind and use it in your favor. Now my colleague Ralph will take over and he will give you some tips to solve EMC issues with good layout. Hello everyone and thank you to Frances.
My name is Ralf Omberger and I work as an applications engineer at MPS in Germany. Today we are talking about PCB layout of automotive applications. A difficult test to perform for automotive applications is the CISPA 25, which measures the wired EMC emissions. The supply line and the lines to the, to the LEDs are affected by EMC. In a car, the power supply lines are often unshielded and act as an antenna in the AM and FM radio range. We should only concern about structures that are larger than lambda 10th of the signals we work with. For example, signal tracks, enclosure openings, antenna structures, etc. The tracks on a PCB are capable of emitting EMC if their length is greater than lambda 10th of the frequency. Such a length results in an effective antenna. Radiated immunity test inject signals up to six gigahertz. Lambda 10th is equal to five millimeter. This means that a track in a PCB are susceptible of picking up injected noise. Nowadays, EMC is tested in areas up to six gigahertz for a G wireless LAN. That means tracks of only five millimeter can receive or transmit as an antenna. Tracks longer than five millimeter should be rooted in the internal layers whenever possible, especially signals that connect to high impedance pins on the IC, for example, feedback, enable, current setting, and so on. PCB tracks should be rooted in an internal layer enclosed by GND. Build a Faraday cage enclosing all tracks. On the top layer, please root only short connections. Short is important for all high impedance tracks in order not to be disturbed and also for all tracks with a high frequency in order to minimize radiation. Whenever possible, use a four layer design. It allows for much smaller return paths, easier routing and better terminals. For the example of a four layer PCB, all tracks on the second inner layer enclosed by the first and the bot layer with GND. A four layer PCB is a good compromise between costs and EMC. Avoid cuts on return plane by close parallel bias. Instead, stagger distance them to ensure correct copper fluting. Conductors and vias should be completely enclosed in copper. A Faraday cage with GND is good. Alternatively, use a constant low resistance potential, for example, a DC supply voltage. It's also a stable voltage. The left picture here shows a layout how it should not look. There is an 80 millimeter long track on the top layer. The trace leads to a high impedance sensitive 10 kilo ohm NTC resistor. This track should either be shorter or rooted on an inner layer. Best on inner layer two with a full ground layer in a one between top layer and inner layer two. Encapsulate long sensitive wires with ground. The 80 millimeter long trace is easily disturbed by frequencies larger than 1.6 gigahertz. In this high frequency range, most ICs are no longer able to suppress such EMC interferences results in bad measurement result. The picture on the right here shows how to route this 80 millimeter long track, best rooted on the inner layer two 
under the ground layer one. The picture on the left shows how not to place vias. The vias are placed in a straight line close together. The space between the vias is not enough. They are not completely enclosed by G and D. The shielding Faraday cage is not completely closed. The path between power IC and analog, passive analog components is extended by the poorly placed vias. The return conductor on the GND is extended because no current can flow between the vias. The, there is a picture on the right, Francesc, please. The right picture shows how to place vias better. The small vertical shift allows the vias to be com completely enclosed in GND. The direct way to the GND is shorter here. This reduces the effective series inductance and also the EMC radiation. The Faraday cage reduces the EMC coupling from via to via. The right top picture shows a four layer PCB with components on the top layer only. In this example, all four layers would have an equal distance to each other. We assume that currents flow on the signal top layer, flowing back on the GND layer. The parasitic inductance of this in conductor loop should be as low as possible. On the left is a diagram from Mr. Henry Ott's EMC book. It is a nice recommended book about EMC, electromagnetic compatibility. The diagram shows the inductance of a track on top plane over and G and D plane. The independent variable is the distance between both layers. A larger distance between the two layers increases the inductance of the conductor loop. The lower right picture shows that the prepack between two copper layers should be as small as possible. This reduces the inductance of a conductor loop. A current flow therefore takes place between two layers that are, it, that are ideally close together. When routing the PCB, it is important to pay attention to which layer the forward and return conductors are on. A bad example would be high frequency power current on top and back current on bot layer. The distance between both layers would be, for example, 1.6 millimeters, and this would result in a large inductance. It is always worth to have a look on your used PCB layer technology, how wide the single layers are separated. Keep this in mind when selecting the best layer track combination. This picture here shows a typical four layer PCB with realistic dimension. As you see, the distance between the both outer layers here is very small. Ideal, a current loop always is within this outer layer pair. The best layer distribution on top layer place the short signal tracks and power tracks. On the first inner layer, G and D only avoid to place tracks within this plane. On the second inner layer, signals only, long traces preferred on this layer, all encapsulated with G and D. On the bot layer, all remaining tracks, ideal only the short ones encapsulate all tracks with GND, that's very important. A via from top to bot is here on a standard PCB 
1.6 millimeter long. This is for high frequency, a large parasitic ESL, equivalent series inductance. For example, a higher ESL results in bad working ceramic capacitors versus frequency. Uh, I talk a little bit about the copper thickness. 70 micrometer is better than 35 micrometer, helps cooling the ICs. A larger copper thickness helps to spread heat into the PCB. It is a free heatsink with small cost. The vertical via here is when not fully encapsulated with GND, it acts like a vertical antenna emitting EMC signals. Always think when using vias, the parasitic of a via must be your friend, never your enemy. Use vias where the inductive ESL doesn't matter or where it is an advantage. When doing a layout, and this is very important in your mind, always think like a spectrum analyzer. You must know for each track the current and the voltage wafer and keep and do in your mind a fast Fourier transformation to get a feeling if the track can easily disturb or not. Also get a feeling if the signal has low impedance or high impedance, the high impedance can be more easily disturbed. The layout must be your friend. Keep the voltage and current waveforms of all tracks in your mind before you place tracks. And also, when you do a layout, please help the layouter sit by side with him, do it together and explain him which current waveforms are here and there. Together you create a wonderful layout. So thank you for your attention. Answers and questions are welcome now. Thank you, gentlemen. We'll go ahead and take some questions uh, now. Just a reminder, please be sure to type your questions into the question box located at the bottom of your control panel. We'll give you a few minutes to do that. It looks like we've got our first question here. It'll be answered by Francesc. The question is, what are all the EMI issues that we will face if we place power, uh, power inductor in the bottom and IC in the top to reduce board size? So by doing this, there are two main uh, issues. Uh, first of all, you need to understand how the EMI test is uh, conducted. So uh, usually you have a table with a ground plane underneath and uh, the electric uh, between your uh, device under test and this ground plane. If you connect the inductor on the bottom side of the PCB, this inductor will emit a very high uh, electric field radiation and this will couple directly into the ground return plane. This will create uh, quite a big uh, common mode noise issue. Uh, besides that, uh, you also have uh, the switch node uh, connected. So the switch node going from the IC to the inductor, you have it connected through BS. And this way you are also uh, bringing some noise to the, to the bolt, both top and bottom. So when you are uh, designing, you want to try to have all the power uh, stage on the same layer. So you contaminate one layer with a very big noise but the other layer is uh, silent, right? So if, if you have the perfect uh, setup is to have all the converter on the top side and the bottom of the PCB uh, clear with only ground so that nothing couples into the return plate. If you can do that, try to put the components that are not so sensi sensitive on the bottom, but uh, the inductor would be one of the worst things that you could put there. That's correct, Frances. The inductance and the IC have to be on the same side. 
it's the shortest way for the switching node. That's very important. <coughs> okay, thanks guys. We've got another question here. And the question is what EMI EMC issues are happening if we place open copper without masking under the power pad of SMPSIC? So uh, if, if this copper is connected to ground, uh, there is no issue. So the, the solder mask doesn't bring any EMC uh, benefit. It only isolates the, the copper from uh, the chassis or whatever is the PCB mounted on. So there, there wouldn't be any issue if this uh, copper is connected to ground. If this copper is floating, uh, then it doesn't bring uh, such a good EMC shielding, but still it's not terrible. Just uh, make sure uh, you connect it to ground to get uh, the benefit of having also the other power planes for uh, heat dissipation. Uh, such islands of copper always connect them to ground. If it is not possible to connect to ground, connect it to the next stable voltage, like power supply or 5 volts, 3.3, or just leave it. It's also an option, but that's not so good. Better ground and, and then it's okay. Okay, we've got another question here. In general, uh, also in high voltage ACDC, is it correct to avoid uh, the spread of the GND plane under the converter circuitry? Uh, you always should spread that potential, that plane to which you are measure the EMC and that's in most cases the ground. Okay, the next question is, how can I reduce ringing at the switch node? So mainly ringing comes from a parasitic inductance in the current loop. And the current loop uh, in a back converter, for example, it's mainly the input uh, bypass capacitors and the switches. So if you see some uh, ringing in the switch node, it means that there is a parasitic, capacitor, a parasitic inductance there. So the first thing that you need to make sure is that the input capacitors are placed. They are ceramic capacitors and they are placed as close as possible to the IC. Uh, ideally, you would have uh, big uh, 1206 or 80806 uh, capacitor with a high value, and then you will place an 0603 capacitor very close to the to the IC with uh, 100 nanofarads or so, and place them on the same size on the same side than the IC in the PCB. If you place them on the bottom side and the IC is on top. The parasitic inductance from the BS will uh, disturb uh, this uh, ringing. Also, the capacitor is connected to, to the ground plane uh, on top. And if you have a return plane on the internal layer, also place several BS on this uh, next to the, to the capacitor. There are some uh, references, references online that you can check where uh, it tells you the, the best BS placements for the ground in capacitors, it is usually to place a couple of years on each side of the capacitor. And also to reduce uh, ringing, if this is not enough, you can try to place a snapper in the switch node, but uh, keep in mind that this affects uh, efficiency, so it's not the optimal, uh, it's not the optimal uh, way to solve this. Also make sure that the ringing is not created by the, the probing method that you are using, try to use with the oscilloscope proof, try to use this uh, small spring that usually comes in, comes in the back and have very small loops because sometimes you can see some ringing, but it's not really in the PCB, it's in your measurement. 
Okay, thanks, Francesca. The next question is, some people isolate IC ground with ferrite at IC ground. Will it help in EMI, EMC issues? In a car, you should not do it because the car is, the frame is, is ground. And otherwise you will have differential and you will have problems with the EMC measurement. It's not a industrial application where it's sometimes good, sometimes not, but in a car, one crown for all. Okay, the next question is, does putting sensitive traces into internal layers help only if both surface layers, one and four, are ground plate? So for example, if layer four is not ground, or GND, but only some traces, does it help at all putting some sensitive traces into the internal layer? Um, you should put all the sensitive traces in layer three. Layer one is the top layer. On the top layer, you place all tracks, power tracks. Um, the short ones and the purpose of layer one is to avoid vias. Most uh, traces are on, on top layer without vias. And the second one, always crowned completely without traces, only for emergency. If you don't know where on another, where to place, then it's also okay in layer two, but avoid. And in layer three, place all longer signals where the inductance is not very important. And then on the layer four, all remaining uh, traces where there is no space in layer three, or when layer three is too full so that you can't encapsulate most of the traces with copper, with GND copper, put them on four. And only some traces on four, not all, a few are okay. And also the traces without high voltage and high current change, put them on four and encapsulate again on layer four, everything with ground. That's everything you can do with four layers in case you have many traces to root. So the, the most sensitive ones, put them in layer three and the shortest one in layer one to avoid VIAs. That's a general rule for a four layer design. I would like to add uh, to this, that if you need to route on the bottom layer and also on the internal layer too, uh, it is okay, but try to alternate. So if you are routing on the internal layer too, uh, in that area, on the bottom side, uh, try to put only ground so that this has a direct return path. And the same for ground, so for the bottom layer. So then when you're writing on the bottom layer, try to have ground on the internal layer too, on top of it, uh, to have a very short uh, return uh, path. Great. The next question is, wouldn't these differential filters, capacitors and inductors add acoustic noise to the board, especially when using pulse width modulation dimming? Yes, that is the danger of uh, creating uh, acoustic noise, especially with the frequencies in the PWM dimming, which are sometimes uh, audible. But uh, you need to understand that we, we need to pass uh, EMC compliance. So we need those filters. There is no other way around uh, with a switch mode power supply unless it is a very small power or a low input voltage, but it is usually not the case. So uh, what you can do is try to use a filter uh, components that don't resonate with the frequencies that you are applying uh, PWM. Uh, Ralph uh, knows a lot about uh, audible noise, so he maybe can answer him too. Yes, I would like to add something. The noise source itself is the ceramic capacitor class 2 and class 3. 
due to the piezoelectric effect. And the noise don't come from the capacitor, the noise comes from the PCB board itself. It's like, a, you can compare it like a guitar. Your finger is the stimulus, is the ceramic capacitor. And the vibration of the ceramic capacitor from the string of the guitar is transmitted to the guitar and the sound comes from the guitar. And on the PCB, the sound comes from the PCB itself. It's like a loudspeaker. And what you can do in such a case is mount the PCB on many places wherever possible and try to damp this acoustic system. Uh, the, the sound you hear is the resonance frequency of the PCB. <clears throat> and when, for example, you must do a fast Fourier transformation of the current waveform in your capacitor, and then check if there is a frequency component exactly hits the resonance frequency of the PCB. And the resonance frequency of the PCB, you can measure easily with, take a, take a pencil or something and hit it and make a knock on it and measure with a microphone the response in the time domain or in the frequent, better in the time domain. And then you will see there the resonance frequency. And if the current waveform in the ceramic capacitor is close to the resonance frequency of the PCB, then you will have maybe problems with acoustic noise. Okay, the next question is, are there any EMI EMC issues due to poles and zero settings of the feedback circuit in the switching IC? Sorry, I was muted. Uh, so uh, if there is some instability on the circuit, uh, there can be uh, some low frequency oscillation on the on your uh, design but usually this low filter uh, especially if you are switching at 400 uh, kilohertz is not visible in the CISPR 25 uh, analysis and also these uh, instability issues are usually the noise emitted so that the harmonic component of this instability has very low uh, amplitude so it shouldn't be a problem if you do uh, an EMI analysis, and you have a switching frequency of 400 kilohertz, and you see some small uh, noise peak uh, before 400 kilohertz, it means that usually that there is some uh, oscillation caused by instability, but you will see that they are usually not, not, uh, not a problem. Okay, next question is, if a customer prefers two layer PCB, uh, most of the time to reduce cost, what, what are the EMI, EMC issues in this case? Yes, that's a good question. A two layer PCB, that's very demanding. It's really very demanding because you don't have a closed uh, GND layer. You can try it. We have many reference designs where we pass the CISPA 25, but in the case of a two layer PCB, you need a long time, maybe two or three rounds until the PCB pass. The secret behind two layer is the placement of the components. You must think in the loops where the current is flowing from part to part. Of course, it's the same issue for the four layer, but on the two layer is really more demanding. You must uh, avoid large loops with high uh, voltage and current changes. And of course, then make at least the bot layer full of ground and only with less traces on the bot layer. So then you have on one side the shielding and on top layer, you must have your, your wires. There's nothing you can do. <laughs> 
Yeah, my recommendation would be to, as uh, Ralph said, it's very demanding. So I would recommend adding all these filters that uh, we mentioned in the webinar, the common mode uh, filters, input filters, output filters, add all of these, just that you have the footprint on your PCB to add them if needed. Then when you are testing, you can decide if they are useful or not, and you can just uh, remove, not place the components or place a small uh, zero ohm resistor where you would have placed uh, an inductor. And uh, it's better to have this footprint when you are doing the test. If you go to testing and it fails and you don't have anything in your PCB to mount, then you, you can uh, rework these components, but they will have uh, bad soldering, parasitics and such, and it's a, it can be a nightmare. So uh, if you are doing a demanding design, like a tube layer board, uh, try to to uh, to think in advance, and I'll add all these things. Great, thank you. The next question is: Can a freewheeling diode placed at the outside, at the output side of a buck converter, contribute in CERE issues? Well, they, they can uh, contribute because uh, compared to a monolithic IC, IC where you have uh, both switches integrated on the device, uh, the hot loop, so the, the current loop between the input capacitors and the switches is very small. And when you have this diode uh, outside, uh, the loop is extended uh, with the diode. So you need to place it very close to the IC, uh, keep in mind where the current is flowing. But uh, if the placement is correct, uh, there shouldn't be uh, much issue. Just uh, don't connect any sensitive trace, uh, just right next to the diode, and uh, try to surround it with copper if possible. It's always better to have a monolithic, I see. But uh, sometimes due to uh, thermals or uh, shear size, it's, uh, it's impossible, and these ICs uh, have a free willing diode. Okay, the next question is, how do we avoid acoustical noise caused by the MLCCs connected to the DC-DC? Okay, there is only one chance you have. Shift the mechanical resonance frequency of the PCB high as possible. So far, you are sick, so far your currents in the in the ceramic capacitors, the frequencies are below of that. Uh, the most sensitive range for the ear is about three kilohertz to five, six kilohertz. Above the amplitude must be larger that you hear something. Um, shifting uh, the resonance frequency of the PCB to a higher value is possible for example, make it smaller, but uh, that's not a good option. You need the, the space. The second way is use more fastening points on the PCB. Not only two, take four or five, because each fastening point increase the resonance frequency of the PCB. And additional, reduce the you must damp that resonance frequency. Um, a, hard mounting, a hard mounted PCB has a peak in its resonance frequency. For example, when you put some rubber under the screws, then you damp it a lot because the mechanical energy of the vibrating PCB is transferred in heat in the rubber and this reduce the acoustic noise a lot. The next way, of course, is find a place on the PCB where there is uh, no movement of the PCB at the resonance frequency. But to find this place is very difficult. The master way for this is uh, use a finite element <coughs> simulation, but that's time demanding and you need special software and the skills to operate with it. Another way, again, use the microphone, a stick, 
and touch on the PCB and search for places where it could be not so loud. But in general, that's you can do it on a model before the PCB is rooted. Just uh, take the same PCB size and do experiments with it. The really the most easiest way is fix the PCB on many points. That's the the easiest way. And what also is very important, a PCB which is only lying on the table sounds different from a PCB which is mounted on the later housing for the product. So when you do this test, take the PCB or model of the PCB to the later housing and mount it because the, the mounting of the product has, an, has a high influence of the on the resonance frequency of the PCB. You must test housing and PCB together as one unit and with many fastening points and with a soft material in between. This shifts the resonance frequency to a high value and then there is no stimulus for the PCB and then it should be quiet. Another way could be there are special capacitors there are interposer types, for example, Murata or have them. This is a small ceramic plate where the capacitor is mounted on, and there is a damping material between ceramic capacitor and that interposer ceramic. So that's also a good way. Okay. Okay, the next question is a two part question. Uh, the first part is, is there a general rule concerning the routing of copper trace in EMI? And the second part is, how acute, how does acute angle, how acute angled should the routing be when going around a corner at maximum 90 degrees or less? Um, normally, it doesn't matter in these frequency ranges if you uh, use a corner with 45 degrees or 90. That's really high frequency where it, where it starts matter. In my opinion, it doesn't matter if 45 or 90 degrees for the frequencies of a DC DC converter. Okay, thank you, Ralph. Our last question here is, is it recommended to use a GND plane or should you use conductor tracks for the high current paths? So this is not a trivial topic. But it depends on the application. So if in your PCB there is only the power supply, then uh, I would recommend using just a ground plane for a return. If there are analog uh, components and digital that need a very quiet uh, voltage, then you maybe want to partition the ground planes and uh, have separated, but you need to know what you are doing. It's not a, an easy thing, thing. You need to make sure that all the signals that travel between analog, digital, and power domains have a clear return uh, underneath, or at least that you know where they are flowing. So keep in mind when doing cuts that you need to, if you have uh, signals exiting your domain, analog, uh, digital, or power, you would need some ground beneath them. And then you are uh, starting to lose control of uh, your power plane. So either use just a solid ground or pay very, uh, pay uh, much attention to what you are doing, but don't start separating grounds and uh, playing on ground only on uh, tracks. If, uh, if you don't have a clear, uh, clear idea of how the current is going to flow in the PCB. My recommendation is to use a single uh, uh, ground plane for the, for the PCB usually. Uh, I have the same opinion that Frances. I would use also 
a single ground plane and that's okay. Uh, the most important thing is the placement of the components. So for example, you have a power connector, a terminal, then place it, of course, close next to the ongoing components, of course, and put the, the output connector directly on the capacitor where it has to be. This avoids um, currents spreading within the GND plane. That's a simple rule. Okay, that was our last question for today. Uh, thank, uh, thank you everyone for joining us and thanks for all the great questions. Also a big thank you to Francesc and Ralph for the presentation, that was great. All of our webinars are available for on-demand streaming at monolithicpower.com. Today's webinar will be added about a day or two and we'll also send a follow-up email with all the links to the presentation materials and the video recording. So that was all for today. Thank you and bye for now. <laughs>